Hey there, everyone. That Sexy Nerd is back again, and we're doing more extra history with Wusi Tan. And, man, I've been waiting for this one already. Uh, I'm, like, really excited. I was really fascinated by her rise to power. I want to see how she actually runs China because a woman uh, running China is kind of weird, isn't it? And that the people actually put up with this. I thought everybody would like just end up like that scene in Blazing Saddles. I hereby assume the duties of the office of sheriff in and for the township of Rockridge. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let us know. Yeah. I thought it'd be just like that, but apparently not. So, why don't we just get into it and find out more information. And remember, please smash that like button if you want to see more sexy and nerdy content. And subscribe if you think I deserve it. And let's do this thing, y'all. Chang'an, China, 657 CE. Wu Zoutian, Empress of China, sees faces in the mirror behind her. She drops the bronze tray she's carrying. And slowly, she turns. It is them, again. Both of them. Empress uh, Wang and pure consort really? Xiao floating above the floor. They have no legs, and blood blossoms on their robes. Their hair, long and unkempt, hangs disheveled, and bruises mark their throats. They say nothing. They never do. They don't need to. Their eyes say it all. How she had them banished to the interior of the palace, confined in a windowless room with only a slit for food. Unable to wash or clean for months, these two former rivals walled up together. And when the Emperor had stumbled upon them and considered granting them mercy, Wu had sent her men to give them a hundred lashes before hanging them. Whoa. And now, they appear to remind her of a terrifying fact. Where she is, they once were. And it'll only take one slip for her to join them. Today's haunting historical tale is made possible haunting. by our creator-owned and operated streaming service, Nebula, where you can actually watch our next episode in this series right after this one, which is like a full week earlier than here on YouTube, but more on that after the episode. When Wu was declared Empress Consort in 655, it wasn't just the two dull points on the love triangle that had to go. She had a whole list of enemies to deal with. Chief among them were those advisors her husband, Emperor Gaozong, had inherited from his father older aristocrats who'd fought and founded the Tang Dynasty and tried to prevent her becoming empress. And Whoa. Wu's supporters, mostly young scholars that gained their positions through the public examination system, absolutely hated them. Whoa. But at first, she waited, and the moves she did make were subtle. For instance, enemies were not punished, but promoted, just to posts that did not suit them or which were far away from court. Uh -huh. And then, stuff started to happen like the secret police catching officials in secret societies and torturing them until they gave up the names of their treacherous co-conspirators. Names that, inevitably, were those of officials who had opposed Wu. The real watershed moment, though, came when one of the old guard officials tried to hit back. See, what? he had learned that Wu's supporter, Cat Lee, Lee <laughs> a.k.a. the Sword in the Smile, had bribed a beautiful prisoner out of jail to be his mistress. Of course, this official took this report of corruption straight to the emperor, but by the... Prose is custom hair care made for the label readers, the skeptics, and most of all, it's... But by the time Wu was done, Cat Lee was cleared of charges, and it was the whistleblower who was exiled. That kicked off the full purge. <laughs> Through gossip, insinuation, and half-true reports from secret police, the Emperor's powerful advisors were exiled, and most chose to take their own lives. Often, though, if they were hesitant, their captors very nicely helped them. In fact, sometimes the Emperor would call someone in to answer for charges, only to find out that, wouldn't you know, on the way, they had confessed to being a super traitor and were immediately executed. Hate when that happens. Soon, even Emperor Gaozong's previous heir was stashed at a border post, and Wu's eldest son named Crown Prince. But these court battles did take a psychological toll on Wu. She felt particularly sharp guilt over the deaths of Empress Wang and Consort Xiao, evidenced by the sources claiming she dreamed nightly that their ghosts haunted her dreams, mutely staring at her in their soiled robes. Well, Supposedly, this was the impetus for Wu and Gaozong to move the capital from Chang'an, instead resituating it in Luoyang, 200 uh, miles to the Luoyang. east. And for the next uh. 50 years, Wu would rule there, only rarely going back to Chang'an. Though, when she did return, she stayed in a brand new palace she ordered constructed. Now, of course, there were other reasons to move the court other than the spooky, scary skeletons in Wu's closet. Lo Yang was better tied into trade networks, and it was closer to Korea, where Chinese armies were fighting to keep a foothold on the peninsula, just across the Yellow Sea. 
Meanwhile, Imperial armies were also battling Turkic tribes in Central Asia to keep control of the Silk Road and expand Chinese territory in the area. This was the time that the Tang was at its greatest territorial extent, and the strain was starting to show, especially on Emperor Gaozong. Always sickly, the Emperor began to experience constant headaches and vision loss that stole his ability to read. At first, this was just a nuisance, but then in 660, Gaozong collapsed and was unable to rise, with doctors attending to his bedchamber. Wu, remaining behind a curtain of beads and pearls, as was customary for women in official settings, looked on in horror as the doctor suggested bleeding Gaozong. At this, she flew into a rage, screaming that it was treason, and if anyone were to cut the emperor, they would die stopping only when Gaozong told her they were only trying to do their jobs. Then, when the bleeding appeared to help, a distraught Wu emerged from the curtain in a stunning break of protocol and, apologizing through tears, gave the doctor's jewels off her own arms. Now, her reaction here can be read a number of ways. After all, this man was not only her access to power, but also the one shielding her from enemy reprisal. Yet it also may speak to Wu's genuine affection for Gaozong, with the pair being unusually close. Really? Though even that was turned against her, as due to Wu's frequent time in the bedroom with her husband, she was sometimes cast as a sort of vitality-sucking sex vampire, you know, draining his male power and making him sick. Fuck anyway, off. Finding it difficult to manage the constant flow of petitioners and officials wanting decisions, Gaozong began to rely heavily on Wu for advice. She would sit beside him behind her modesty screen and whisper what rulings he should make. This burden removed, he started to attend less and less to everyday tasks. And through her husband, Wu began to make policy. She banned women from burlesque performances and reorganized the ranking system of imperial concubines, removing references to gender so it was on par with the rank system for palace officials. Now, some say this was to prevent any concubines from outshining her, but uh -huh. others argue it was an acknowledgement that women of the harem were not just pretty playthings, but performed a vital role in the civil service. Most crucially, however, she managed the war in Korea, choosing really? generals and launching a new expedition into northern Korea. But while Wu was the power behind the throne, her position was precarious. Perhaps that's why, after Gaozong recovered sufficiently to take back over some of his duties, she then engaged the Taoist sorcerer to help her control the emperor through magical means. This, of course, was the same crime that had led to Empress Wang and Consort Xiao's fall. And indeed, when Gaozong found out, it was the closest their ghosts came to getting revenge. Well. The order of demotion and expulsion was in Gaozong's hand when Wu heard of it and came running to his chambers, begging him not to go through with it. Once again, she worked her charm, and in the end, it actually was the officials that drew up those papers that ended up on the scaffold. Ah! That was the last major resistance to Wu's rule over Gaozong. As his health took another downswing, the emperor once again increasingly leaned on Wu to make decisions. Soon, when officials came to him with policy issues, his first question was if they'd asked the empress. And given Gaozong's decline, it was clear that Wu must have been thinking about the realities of succession. Her husband was slowly dying, and her son's still relatively young. She needed to secure her position, and decided that she would use religion to do it. Wu began pushing for her title to be upgraded, for if her husband was the son of heaven, ruling via divine favor, surely she then was the heaven empress. Hmm. Lunar New Year, 666 CE, Mount Tai. It is the sacrifice to heaven. heaven and earth. A set of rituals so expensive, they've not been conducted for 600 years. Really? For a full day, <laughs> the pale Gaozong does what emperors have done before him, making offerings to his imperial ancestors, walking to the summit, and burying two enormous jade slabs there to report his dynasty's success to heaven. The cold mountain wind carries incense smoke away into the sky. Ambassadors from every corner of the Empire watch, along with shackled prisoners of war, whose spirits soon will be ritually offered to the gods before they're released. And that... Books change people's lives. Something I've written never changed your life? Absolutely. My dining room table... And that's when the tradition changes. Because when those rituals are complete, and the procession returns to the mountain base, the sacrifices to Earth begin. For centuries, the Emperor conducted these as well. But not today. Just before the rituals begin, Empress Wu pointed out that while heaven is suffused with male yang energy, the earth was a female yin element, and therefore must be conducted by women. Gaozong and his court leave, 
clearing the area. As the Heaven Empress Wu and her court ladies share a symbolic banquet of food and wine with the earth, usurping the most powerful ritual in all of Chinese really? religion. And Wu would not stop there. Because the Heaven Empress would only grow in power. And soon, the heavens, the earth, and even the monasteries of the Buddha would be within her grasp.